Now, Mr. Ramirez, how many years did you work with the Sinaloa cartel? For approximately 17 to 18 years. And you just described the structure of your organization. Did you see any similarities in those 18 years work with the Sinaloa cartel between the two organizations? Yes. Briefly, what were those? Well, they had, well, they also used corruption to receive and to protect my cocaine shipments, and they also had an armed wing. Okay, let's go to when the defendant first started transporting your cocaine. You said this was approximately what year? In approximately 1990. And when you were sending, were you sending cocaine to the United States before the defendant started transporting your cocaine here? Correct. When did you start becoming involved in the drug trade in the United States? Approximately somewhere between 1985-1986. How did you get started in the drug trade in those years? Well, I was receiving cocaine in the United States to distribute it and sell it on the streets. Did you ever come to the United States? Correct. When was the first time you came to the United States? In approximately 1985-1986. And during this time, how many visits to the United States did you engage in? Three or four times. Where would you travel to in the United States? I traveled to Miami in Florida, Los Angeles, California, and New York. What did you do when you would come to the United States on these trips? Receive cocaine to distribute it and sell it on the streets of New York mainly? Anything else? I received the cocaine. We would process it at a lab in Florida in Miami. Once the drugs were sold in New York, what else did you do related to the drug trade? Pick up the money so that it could be sent to Colombia? Did you eventually have an infrastructure in the United States? Yes. And in what United States cities did you have infrastructure? In Los Angeles, California, in New York, mainly, and Chicago. I also did in Houston and Phoenix, Arizona. What time frame are we talking about? What years? So I started creating the infrastructure more or less in 1986-1987, and I kept it until approximately 1996-1997. Can you describe for the members of the jury what the infrastructure was that you had in Los Angeles? Yes, well, I had several cells, and they had houses where they would receive the cocaine that was coming from Mexico in order to store it in those homes, in those houses, and to then transport it to New York. And we also had the cars to receive that cocaine in Los Angeles, and we also had the transport in order to transport it from Los Angeles to New York City. How would your cocaine get transported from Los Angeles to New York City? We transported it in several ways. Sometimes we used tractor trailers, camper cars, small cars with hidden compartments, and even airplanes were used. What infrastructure did you have in New York? I had an infrastructure that was comprised of several cells to receive the cocaine that was coming from Los Angeles in order to store it and to later distribute it in the streets of New York, and we also had a separate infrastructure to pick up the money, the proceeds of the sales of the cocaine to be sent to Colombia, the money. You mentioned that you had separate structures, one for drugs and one for money. Was that on purpose? Yes. Why? To keep the cocaine separate from the money so as not to mix them in that and that way to avoid seizures of the American authorities. You mentioned that you would gather the money in New York. Where would you send it? We used to send it to Colombia mainly. Did you send your money to anywhere else other than Colombia? No, to Colombia. For what purpose? To pay the Mexicans for the transport of my cocaine. When was your last trip to the United States? 1988, approximately. Why did you not return after that? Because I tried to enter with a fake passport and I was caught by the authorities in Miami and they sent me back to Colombia that very same day. What happened to you when you got back to Colombia? I was arrested for using fake documents. And what happened to you? I went to prison for approximately a month. How did you get out? By making corruption payments. Did you do anything to have this criminal arrest record expunged? Yes. What did you do? I made corruption payments so that that would be completely disappeared and there would be no trace of it. 
Did you pay to expunge any other records in Colombia? Yes. What did you pay for? I paid to destroy so that there wouldn't be any trace of any picture of mine in any government office, Colombian government office, that may have a photograph of me. I also disappeared my fingerprints and I disappeared all trace of my having been in prison, all the files of my having been in prison in Colombia. Do you know what a cedula, C-E-D-U-L-A is? Cedula? Yes. What is it? It is an identification document that we use in Colombia. Did you do anything with regards to your records on this document? Right, I disappeared them completely. Why did you do all of this? So as to avoid the authorities would have any information about me to avoid an arrest so that it would be more difficult for them to have and that would benefit, that would make my illegal activities easier. Your Honor, I'm about to get into a new topic. I don't know if you want me to keep going. If you can keep going a little more, I think we should. Absolutely. Okay. Mr. Ramirez, you testified that at the time of your arrest in 2007 in Brazil, you were the leader of the North Valle Cartel? Correct. When did you start working for the North Valle Cartel? 1987-88 approximately. And in the beginning of these years, in the 1980s, what was your role with the North Valle Cartel? To receive cocaine in small quantities in Los Angeles, California, and to transport it to New York. I think there might be a clarification. The interpreter needs to clarify a term. Interpreter's correction, in bulk. He didn't say in small quantities, but in bulk. To transport it to New York, then to distribute it and sell it in the streets of New York and return the money from the sales to Colombia. How were you able to continue running a drug operation in the United States if you didn't go back? Through the infrastructure that I had set up in the United States and through my lieutenants in the United States, what do you mean by the term lieutenant? Lieutenant means those people who work for me and my organization. Did you eventually take a more active role in the drug business in Colombia itself? Yes. What did you do? Well, I decided to go up through the ranks of the cartel, the North Valle cartel, and I began to take care personally, myself, of the shipment of drugs to Mexico. I would go to the clandestine landing strips in Colombia where the planes would come from Mexico. I also decided to visit the labs where the, where the said cocaine was produced, and that's how I started to go up, little by little, in the North Valle Cartel. Now, you mentioned that you would go to the clandestine airstrip. What is a clandestine airstrip? A clandestine landing strip, an airstrip that is, does not appear or is not registered on any navigational charts. In general, they're not paved, they are dirt roads. And in Colombia, many locations, they are located in the middle of the mountains, in the middle of the jungle. All of this is to, of course, avoid the authorities who would have seized the cocaine in the plains. You mentioned planes. How would your cocaine get from Colombia to Mexico? Initially, at first, by planes. During this time, in the beginning years, what kind of planes did you use to transport cocaine from Colombia to Mexico? We use mainly some planes that are called turbo propeller. Turbo Commanders, King 300s, Cheyenne, Conquer, mainly, those mainly. How would you obtain these planes? We bought them. Where would you buy these planes? Many times we bought them in the United States, yes, and then they were taken to Colombia. The planes that you purchased in the United States and would take to Colombia, did you have to do anything to them to prepare them to transport your cocaine? Yes. What did you do? We had to install a device to be able to carry more fuel and remove the seats. Why would you remove the seats? Because we needed the room to place the bales with my cocaine and the additional fuel tanks. Why did you need to make room for additional fuel? Well, because according to the distance that the plane would have to fly to make it to Mexico, we needed to place additional fuel. Otherwise, the tanks itself of the plane were not enough. Did you have any role with the pilots that would fly these planes? Let me rephrase that. Did you have any interaction with the pilots that would fly these planes? Of course, completely, all the time. Why? Because I would speak to them, I would hire them. I had my own pilots who belonged to my organization, and every time they went to Mexico and would come back to Colombia, 
I would get together with them so they could tell me how the flight had been, how the operation had been conducted, how they had been received by the Mexicans, how the landing strips were. Now you mentioned that you went to laboratories. What's a laboratory? A laboratory is the place where the cocaine is processed. Why did you go to the laboratories? Because I wanted to supervise to make sure that the cocaine that I was sending to the United States via Mexico was of optimal quality. All right, did you become familiar with how cocaine was made? Yes. Can you briefly describe for the jury how it is that cocaine is made? Correct. In Back in the 90s, cocaine, we would bring it by plane from Peru and Bolivia, which were the base of coca, of coke. Some of the time, we would use Colombian coke, which was collected, and it was first cocaine base, which is a yellowish powder. And then later, once it is transported to the cocaine labs, we would dry it up and we would clean it because it would be dirty. And then we began the process, which consisted in adding, adding some chemicals so that the cocaine, the cocaine crystals would come up, would result, meaning pure cocaine. So for that, we would add sulfuric acid, ether, acetone, potassium permanganate, gas, gasoline, among other chemicals. And once the cocaine was actually made, how was it packaged? Once the cocaine came off from the liquid, we would dry it up in microwave ovens and we would give it the shape that we wanted. To give you an example, if it was to be a square, we would give it that shape. Then there it would be vacuum packed and it would be taped, taped up and we would place a brand on it. Let me step back one second, Mr. Ramirez. You made a motion when you were doing the tape. How much tape would you put on these kilos of cocaine? Well, we would just grab a roll of tape and just use it, you know, do it, just do it, do it. I wouldn't know exactly how much tape we used, but we used a lot of it to protect it. And once it was wrapped in the tape, what would you do with the kilos? We would place our brand on them and we would place it in burlap sacks, which were usually between 25 and 30 kilograms of weight. So then it was ready to be sent to Mexico. The sacks that you described, what do they look like? Sometimes they were military sacks that we used and some of them just duffel bags. Mr. Goldberg, at a convenient time? Yes. Is it now? This one is fine, Your Honor. Okay, let's take our mid-afternoon break, ladies and gentlemen. We will come back here at 3.35. Please remember not to talk about the case. See you then.